Welcome to Regency Run Bluffers. This time in our series about Regency characters, I'm going to talk about Beau Brummel. Some of you may most readily recognise him from the recent BBC miniseries, Beau Brummel, This Charming Man. Beau Brummel was born on the 7th of June 1778, and he was a Regency dandy and fashion leader, famous for his elegant dress, his witty remarks, and his friendship with the Prince of Wales, later to be the Prince Regent and eventually George IV. Brummel was born in Downing Street, where his father was a private secretary to Lord North. His father was intent that George should be brought up as a gentleman, so Brummel was sent to Eton, where he mingled with the aristocracy, becoming known for his gentlemanly manners and ready wit, and also his interest in dress and elegant bearing. This earned him the name Beau Brummel. He went to Oxford for a year, but then in 1794 bought a commission, as a cornet, the cheapest possible commission, since they were bought in those days, in the Prince of Wales' own regiment, the 10th Royal Hussars, where, through the force of his personality, he developed a friendship with the Prince, who was fascinated by him. He was promoted to captain to the annoyance of other officers, who had to buy or earn such status. Maintaining a position in the regiment was an expensive business, since in those days officers had to buy their own uniform, and the prince kept changing them, so this was no small matter. They had to buy their own horse, pay their mess bills, and generally keep up with the other officers. And since it was the Prince of Wales Regiment, it was much more expensive to hold your own with the others, who were mostly aristocratic officers. However, he succeeded to a fortune of about £30,000, which was a bequest from his father, who had died in 1794. Now, this was the equivalent in those days of about £5 million now, so it was a considerable sum. The regiment was posted to Manchester, which did not suit his plans, so he resigned his commission, stating the reason to be that uh, the city had a poor reputation, undistinguished ambiance, and a, a want of culture and civility. Rather more importantly, the prince had stayed in London. Setting up a bachelor establishment in Mayfair, he became, as a result of the Prince of Wales' friendship and his own good taste in dress, the recognised arbiter of fashion and a frequenter of all society's gatherings. He was renowned for his wit, but also his rudeness. He would sit in the bow window of White's, his club in London, and pass judgment upon the dress and manner of all of the population who passed by. Acolytes would visit his home to watch his preparations for the day, which could take up to four hours to reach a state of perfection to his satisfaction. They didn't need to arrive early, since his view of the day was, whether it is summer or winter, I always like to have the morning well aired before I get up. He would famously get through many starched cravats, which, if the knots were not to his satisfaction, were discarded for a fresh one. And legend said he would also insist on his boots being polished with champagne, though I somehow doubt this since they would end up rather sticky as a result. He was jealous of his personal reputation as a trendsetter, so would he instructed many different tailors, so none of them would assert that it was they and not him who were the creators of the fashions. None of this came cheaply. When asked by a lady how much it would cost for her son to be fashionably dressed, his reply was, My dear madam, with strict economy, it might be done for 800 a year. Shunning the previous ornate style of men's clothing, hitherto popular, 
His style in clothes was for understatement. His saying was, to be truly elegant, one should not be noticed. He disliked pretense. As he was passing in the street, a lady once called down to him, inviting him up to take tea. To which he replied, Madam, you take medicine, you take a walk, you take a liberty, but uh, you drink tea. And he continued on his way. His look required a perfectly fitted dark coat, pantaloons, not breeches, and an immaculate shirt and cravat. He was also fastidious about personal hygiene. He was the font of wisdom for all things dandy, to whom the ton, the, the fashionable inner circle of the upper classes, deferred for fashion advice. It could be said that it was his influence that created the image we now all have in our minds of the perfectly prepared Regency gentleman. He was a fastidious eater and disliked any vegetables. When asked at a dinner party whether he ever ate vegetables, his reply was, uh, Yes, madam, I, I once ate a pea. Unfortunately, in order to keep up with the gambling of all of his aristocratic friends and to maintain his sartorial standards, the finite sum he inherited, however large it must have been, dwindled and he began to amass a great deal of debt, since his position and association with the prince enabled him to obtain credit. However, his downfall came when he lost the patronage of the prince, who was gaining weight all the time, but was sensitive about it. In July 1813, Brummel had earlier had a quarrel with the prince, but reluctantly felt obliged to invite him to a ball given in the Argyle Rooms in London by Brummel, Lord Olvenley, Sir Henry Mildmay and Henry Pierpoint to celebrate a gambling win. On arrival, the prince greeted three of the hosts, but ignored Brummel, who... Stung by the insult, said in a voice which could be heard throughout the room, Onvenly, who's your fat friend? The prince never spoke to Brummel again. Brummel's personal reputation was not immediately damaged, but the rift with the prince had an enduring effect on him. Creditors began to complain more loudly. The debts he did pay, however, were his gambling debts, since these were debts of honour. However, the time came when finally he could not pay even these, and there was an ominous entry in the gambling book of his club whites, for one of his wages marked not paid 20th of January 1816. The pack of cards collapsed, and in order to escape debtor's prison, he fled to Calais in France, where he spent the next ten years. In 1826, through intervention by friends, he was given the position of British consul to Caen, but this came to an end two years later, after he recommended that the consulate be closed, thinking with classic Brummel arrogance that a better paid position would be offered to him. It was not. By 1835, his health failing, he was put into a French debtor's prison, but was still able to inspire loyalty in his friends who secured his release in 1836. He could be seen wandering the streets of Caen in an increasingly desperate and dirty state, descending into insanity through his diseases. He died in 1840 and is buried in Caen. Such was the force of his personality, his prominence in Regent society, 
and his effect on fashion of the day, that his reputation endured, and his name came to be a byword for sartorial elegance and fastidious attention to appearance. There is a statue to him in German Street in London, still the street containing bespoke tailors. Books have been written of his witticisms, and he has appeared in a, as a character in a number of novels. Into the 20th century, he has been the subject of stage plays, operettas, radio plays and films, and more recently TV dramas, the most recent being Bo Brummel, this charming man. Because his name is synonymous with style and good looks, it's often been used by manufacturers to denote style for products, such as wristwatches and car paint colours, and personal grooming products. The world of music even borrowed his name, jazz bands and pop groups naming themselves after him, or mentioning him in song. Bizarrely, there is even a rock climber's route at Mount Maroon in Australia named after him. Most surely he would have been flattered by all of this, but of course would have absolutely disapproved. Thank you.